Uh, welcome, um, both uh, fans uh, old and new. And if you are new um, uh, to the show, new to the prehistory guys, me, Michael, Im, Rupert, <laughs> um, don't be shy. Uh, let us know who you are in the chat. We'll t do our best to keep uh, uh, notice of, of what's going on in the chat chat uh but we will apologize mm. if uh, if we miss stuff it uh, the more people there are here obviously the better mm. but the more people there are here the more likely we are to uh miss uh, the chat so don't be frightened to ask questions but don't be offended okay. if we um if we miss them uh yes because we inevitably will, partly because half of the time uh, comments are going up so quickly that we just miss things you know um, We're only human. Anyway, all is good. Everything. All is yeah. good. So, coming <laughs> yes. up, eh? Coming up, uh, Chinese ancient ancient Chinese metallurgy. A massive megalithic complex mm -hmm. discovered in Spain. A fascinating eight thousand two hundred year old burial in Russia, and a very unusual Bronze Age cremation site. So that's in the uh, in the newsy and uh, um, turning back the boundaries bit. Um, but I have to say, I mean, we've already spilt the beans on this in the pre-show, but uh, you'll be glad you tuned in um, because uh, uh, in order to make sure that we didn't go off into the you know deep grass when uh, just bashing between the two of us about uh, conflict in, in prehistory, um, we're absolutely delighted and thrilled to be able to say that we'll be joined later on by Dr. Martin Smith of Bournemouth, Bournemouth University. He's a principal academic in forensic and biological anthrop anthropology and specialises in the study of conflict in prehistory. So, and uh, the idea is, I think, to break it down. And among other things, we'll be talking about how archaeology can help us understand whether war stroke organised conflict is hardwired into human beings or, or is it simply a practical response to environmental or social circumstances? Highfalutin stuff! Aren't you glad you came? Any thoughts on that, Mr. Soskin? Uh, yeah, you don't want to set me off this early on, though, do you? Because no, you know, you can just see that it's hard hardwired in primates, anyway. Chimp <laughs> and uh, and we've lost your sound, Rupert. Something went chink, and we've lost your sound. Nothing coming through here. All right, you'll be back in a moment. I understand. All right. So here's the thing, folks. I did, um, I did uh, some stats uh, just earlier on. I did some uh, totting up earlier today um, about all the uh, uh, some the stuff that we've got on YouTube. Oh, he's back. Good. <clears throat> Hopefully. There he is. Can we talk? Oh, we can hear you. We can hear you now. Don't worry. Anyway, as I was saying, um, I was doing some totting up, and <laughs> surprise, surprise, there must be about 40 hours of viewing on uh, the Prehistory Guys uh, YouTube channel. Um, which, which is nice. There's a variety of stuff. There's films, there's, you know, recordings of live shows and all the rest of it. Um, but the thing is, there's mm. another 40 hours worth of uh, completely exclusive content that we've produced on our Patreon page. Rupert, did you know that we've done a, over 130 podcasts uh, in the past, what, three years or so? I, actu I actually didn't. Yeah. I really did not. Uh, I, can't, so, I can't pretend I've been counting ever. No, but, no. Um, it's not a sort I'm of just thing amazed you do, that people really. like to listen to us. That's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, there's there's that, and there's loads of other patron only stuff, uh, you know, for our patron supporters, uh, pa Patreon supporters, behind the scenes stuff. So what I'm just saying, really, if you like our stuff, if you if you'd like to see more of it, indeed, or if you'd simply like to help support what we do. 
Five dollars, four pounds a month uh, gets you access to a whole load of our content, and uh, you get on the inside track of what we're up to, and um, you know, become part of what we call the team or the crew or what have you. Yeah, yeah, the crew. And your sound has it's gone. Questionable. Oh no, it's back again. Don't don't worry. You're it's going to frighten me if you keep saying things like that. Well, we'll see. I'm sure it'll all come out in the wash. Before we kick off uh, with the first item, you know, that we're talking about, I just need to say a few words about the next few weeks, um, you know, what's happening. There will be a break in our kind of uh, rhythm of uh, the, the regular monthly outgoing, certainly as far as the live shows are concerned, because Rupert and I uh, are leading a tour of uh, folk um, around uh, the ancient sites, the megalithic sites of uh, Ireland, which should be wonderful. Our aim is to do as much as we can, yes. feeding back from uh, being in Ireland uh, through the, uh, you know, we should be able to get stuff up in the field or even broadcast back from a hotel room here, here or there. But uh, our commitment is to, to make sure that the, some content keeps flowing anyway but it will break our rhythm so we'll, it will it'll be uh, a month or so before we properly uh, uh, back in in the saddle it's uh, it's funny how these things occur anyway enough of this um whiffle uh, mm -hmm. is it time rupert to um, move on is there anything else you want to say no, I mean, we were chatting earlier on um, when we were just going through what we would be going through this evening. And I said to you then that there was something I was going to say, and I didn't remember what it was then. And the honest truth is, I don't remember now. So, uh, <laughs> so no, we might as well just move on. Yeah, all right. Uh, you are a bit out of sync, but we'll just have to uh, deal with that. Never mind. Okay. Yeah, um, um, I ha I have to say I I don't know why uh, connection is so flaky today. I confess that you're out of sync for me as well. Okay. Uh, I just hope that everything is working comfortably for Martin for later on. We'll see uh, what happens. Yes, yeah, indeed. <laughs> Um, so, for those of you who don't know, uh, I'm in Warwickshire and uh, in in England. Rupert's way down is uh, what a thousand miles away, almost uh, down in the uh, in the south of France. Um, out of I sync am, is out, yes. but your picture's fine. So you know, swings and roundabouts. <laughs> pushing back to the boundaries. Yes, pushing back the boundaries. We can't have it all, can we? Mm. Yeah, jolly good. Well, uh, this is a fun one, actually. I mean, normally, uh, you know, those of you who are regular viewers will know that the pushing back the boundaries is normally a question of pushing things back in time, the oldest this or the earliest that. But uh, this time, it's it's actually pushing back the boundaries of knowledge, uh, which mm. is, uh, it, this is a fascinating one. It's from China. It's 2,300 years old, and it's basically, it's a chemistry formula for metallurgy. And uh, so it comes from a, a Chinese text. It's known as the Qiaogong Ji text. And it's, it's affectionately called the oldest known technical encyclopedia. Yes. And it has uh, these uh, these chemical formulas in it. And so a translation of a couple of uh, sections, for example, the gin is divided into six tin occupies. Oh, oh, hang on, oh, I think I've got that this... on screen for you, Rupert, if you want to. Have you, have you got that? Excellent. Hold on a second. Yeah. Try it. There you go. Excellent. Well done. So yeah. the, uh, now this is the re receipt for bells and tripod vessels. Now, obviously, this is a mistranslation. It means this is the recipe for mm. bells and tripod vessels. Then, as, uh, then the next one is the gin is divided into five. Tin occupies one. This is the recipe for axes and hatchets. Now, the thing is, this uh, text was found uh, over a century ago. And for over a hundred years, researchers have been trying to make sense of these ingredients, tried and failed. Uh, they've uh, tried all sorts of uh, very real um, foundry procedures and never managed to come up with anything that matches 
what is talked about in the text. Now, obviously, we're talking about bronze, so the presumption was always that it was different uh, amounts of, uh, of copper and tin. Uh, but it's only now that researchers from uh, the British Museum and Oxford University have twigged that these people, these uh, uh, these metal workers way back then, were using pre-mixed alloys. And uh, so they think that, um, uh, in fact, they're pretty sure of this. They've done an awful lot of testing to arrive at these conclusions. So you've got two different uh, alloys. One is a mixture of copper, tin and lead, and the other is a premix of copper and lead. And it's these two things together that uh, uh, that actually makes sense of the formula that's in the text. Yeah. Now, how they came to do this uh, is once again a fantastic example of researchers looking at old stuff and saying, well, what happens if we apply modern lab techniques to try to unravel this? And what they did was they got some Chinese bronze coins these are sword coins from the same period and uh there you go that's uh it's an extraordinary thing actually a, a slight digression when you think that okay. these are coins um it's uh it's put a hole in your in pocket comparatively, wouldn't they comparatively <laughs> it's only in comparatively recent history that uh, that we've been making coins to be round uh, and mm. in fact china had uh, had a history of the most extraordinary. Well, I've got a slide of spade uh, coins and yeah. Have you got a, a slide? There okay, it is. There you go. Now that is a perfect thing. That is Chinese coins over a few thousand years. The mm. the round coins are uh, a lot more recent. But the interesting thing is that in pretty much all cases. Uh, you know, they are designed so that they can be threaded. They can be worn, basically. You could wear them on a belt. You could put them around your neck or, or whatever. There's a, there's always a hole so that they can be strung. Um, but anyway, that's the thing. They they took these, uh, uh, these coins, sword coins, bronze coins, from the period and broke them down and actually figured out that these were the alloys that uh, that they were using. So these two things, uh, gin and chi, are the names of these two substances that now they have figured out were these pre-prepared alloys for metalwork. There you go. That is your Pushing Back the Boundaries for September 2022. <laughs> and I don't know what's happening I don't to know no more. I don't know. Uh, I hope you can still hear me properly, but my uh, uh, vision seems to be a bit wobbly now. I think it's just one of those times in time and space where communications uh, have a Look, I'm uh, going all uh, blippy. I can only hope that uh, clears if, if itself up. If it makes up. you feel any better, there is a lot of outrageous solar activity going on at the moment that they've mm. been saying for quite a while could be mm. disrupting uh, internet and satellite communications, and it could just easily be something like that. We will yeah. carry on regardless and hope it all works out. Uh, we will indeed. Actually, th there is a, a, a very fascinating sidebar to uh, all this. I don't in the text there. Um, get back to it there. Mm. Uh, in the text there, it mentions uh, tripod vessels. This is a this is a complete and utter mm. um, kind of uh, side uh, thing, but it's something that's easy to skip by if you don't know. Now, just down the road, I've got a wonderful art gallery and museum which has a collection of uh, Chinese artifacts in there, and I know this thing very well indeed. It's in the gallery there. I've often gone past it. That is <clears throat> a um, what about a six thousand year old or thereabouts, uh, tripod um, uh, vessel. And it just struck me only today when I was thinking about this. I thought, hang on, of course. That is three um, liquid-carrying skins and some bladders, somebody's, so, yeah. bladders or whatever. So, and so somebody's been carrying three of them and, and 
put them down together, and lo and behold, they've all stayed upright instead of falling over. <laughs> and here we've got <laughs> the the somehow that idea is, and the and the shape and everything has transformed itself into pottery because you've still got the stitching down the sides in uh, you know yeah. represented it in the in the pottery. <laughs> And uh, I don't doubt that from those origins, much, much later on, the time we're talking about now, that filters through to you know, tripod vessels just being the, the thing. It's quite unique to China. I'm just thinking, was that, was that the origins of it? Three, three goods, three skins full of water put down, just stay where they are instead of keeling over? What do you think? <laughs> interesting isn't it yeah well, it could hey. it could be why not why not well it's my theory and it's my theory alone <laughs> <laughs> and you on heard that it note here first <laughs> <laughs> shall we move on to uh, prehistory news yeah. um what we've got uh, kicking off is um some of you may have seen this in the, actually in in the news, uh, if you keep track of these sorts of uh, things. Uh, an extraordinary uh, sight uh, right down uh, in the south on the border, uh, Spain and uh, Portugal. Huge megalithic complex, uh, more than 500 standing stones. Now, here's the thing. Um, this is not to be confused with this other one. Spanish site that's been in the news recently, which has been exposed because of the dropping water levels in the reservoir that you can see behind there. This, the identical thing happened um, a few years ago, and it was in the news then, uh, the dolmen of uh, Guadalajara uh, being exposed by the dropping levels. This is not <clears throat> fascinating, though this one is. Um, it spends its time, most of its time underwater. No, um, this one is um, uh, uh, land-based, not far from uh, the coast, about 15 uh, kilometres uh, as things are at the time. But I'm led to believe that uh, at the time it may have actually been closer to the coast, which kind of uh, makes sense. So <sighs> apparently what happened... A guy owns the land upon which this is. We're going to find this, uh, and uh, the uh, the price of avocados is going up. So this guy reckons he's going to make a killing by using his land to plant a load of um, avocados. So he goes to the local authorities to to get permission to convert use get the use of land over to this, and they say, "Well, I think because there was a known." you know, um, megalithic site already there. I think there was a stone circle already there. They go, whoa, not before we've done a survey. They did a survey and boom, um, they found all these standing stones and uh, kists and, uh, uh, and dolmens stretched over this hillside. So the poor avocado guy, I don't know what's going to happen to him, um, because the archaeology on the site um, is going to be going on for, uh, well, till uh, 2026, I 2000. do believe. Indeed. Did I say right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yes, for what it's worth, for what uh, it's I worth. I can't remember how many acres it is. Have you, you, haven't got a, you haven't got a figure there for oh, how many acres Oh, I think it, it was uh, 15, uh, 1,500 acres. I'll I'll get the the article up in a moment so I can double check that. But it's 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 a it's a large area. So uh, I think some of the things were ab above ground, as you can see here, and that may have been a pre-existing one they already knew about. But the survey uh, entailed all sorts of aerial survey and magnetometry s surveys and that kind of thing. And it's only with that being applied that uh, it seems these sites have been uh, revealed in uh, oops gone too far uh, in some kind of uh, context um so let me just mm. double check uh, on that yes 1500 acres 600 hectares um um so when this has been reported um in the press it seems to have been all all 
uh, inevitably accompanied um, with, with a photograph from Karnak uh, up, in, up in Brittany. Um, yeah. Now, <laughs> yes. Oh, I thought you were laughing at something else then. This, this delay is killing me. <laughs> no, 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 I'm, I'm laughing at the fact that it's, it's you, you've got to love the press. Uh, you've got to love the press. They, ha they can't get a well, photograph that they like of the actual site, so they put Karnak on instead. It's great. Well, fair. But, but the comparison is kind of fair. Um, I mean, 526 is a lot. Uh, however, that said, there are you know, over 3,000 standing stones with alignments uh, at Karnak. But one of the things that's coming out, uh, I've just got to reiterate that most of these stones that they've discovered, of course, are under the ground. Otherwise, you know, I think the guy would be thinking twice about putting the avocado. Um, what, what do you call it? It's not an, or <laughs> not an orchard, is it? Avocado plantation, it's call it. Probably an avocado uh, plantation, on, yes. A plantation uh, on the site. So, yeah. A lot of these stones are under the ground, lying on the ground, um, w what have you. Um, and the analysis will, will take a, a few years to, to get right. But it's interesting, the comparisons with, with Karnak, because <laughs> there are alignments within these uh, sites. It, it says, the article says, um, so that yes, most of the men here uh, grouped um, into 26 alignments. Um, and there are two cromlechs, uh, both located on hilltops with a clear view to the east for viewing sunrise during the summer and winter solstices and spring and autumn equinoxes, the researchers said. <coughs> Excuse me. So there's a lot to come out here. And it's a hugely important, um, uh, uh, hugely important site, and uh, a site t to watch, no question. And I like the idea that it's on that on that Mediterranean round, um, you know, uh, the Andalusian coastline and up the Atlantic seaboard sea route that we're told is, you know, is how Karnak gets to be. Uh, such an Im important place because that was the final destination for all of the goods coming round uh, that part. You know, mm. and we're talking the dating we're talking about is commensurate with uh, Karnak. We're talking about um, uh, five thousand, four thousand BC. So there you go. And time moves on, and I'm going to leave that for now and uh, let you get on with the next one. Uh, I thank you all. Um, okay, well, I'm taking this over to, it's a site uh, called Salorno uh, mm -hmm. dos de la Forca in, Which uh, is in northern Italy. Right up there. Thank you goodness. very much. There it is. Looks like it's in the Alps. Yes. And uh, uh, it, it's, uh, it's very much on high ground. This, it, it, it's, basically, this is a really, really unusual cremation platform that was in use for generations uh, a couple of hundred years or more and what's so fascinating about this is that the remains it, basically it's an unprecedented amount of cremated human remains uh, you know if you if you imagine cremated fragments that they weigh virtually nothing and uh, they have uh, uh, they have taken out sixty three and a half kilos of bone <laughs> fragments. Now they're not all human bones. Uh, a lot of them are animal bones as well. Uh, there's been shards of pottery and a certain amount of grave goods, uh, pottery and bronze and uh, antlers as well. Fragments of antlers. The the really fascinating thing here is that. Um, some elements seem to have been taken away, but in the main, there is just this ocean of uh, human and animal remains in a site that was never covered. So mm. it's like they had this cremation platform where they were consistently bringing bodies to be burnt, um, but then they were not covered up. They weren't taken away and buried. Well, certain pieces might have been. I mean, maybe they took heads away and buried. I don't know. That's a guess. You know, they're not specified. 
Um, but in the main, it just seems to be this uncovered, uh, permanently exposed cremation platform. And, and for me, that raises so many questions, because if you've got uh, human and animal remains being burnt uh, on the same platform, then is that telling you that uh, that the humans and that there, there wasn't a significant differentiation between uh, between their remains once they were deceased, or is it a completely different thing? You know, is it that they were burning the remains to uh, to get rid of a lot of the risk of disease from rotting flesh, that sort of stuff? Honestly, don't know. There's uh, you know the, the jury is. <clears throat> completely out on that but um but that's it really it's um it did is, you mention it the date genuinely did, unprecedented the amount yeah. of rem- uh did i mention the dates did i not mention the dates it's uh, we're talking about, it's oh. bronze age you're talking av- averaging it <laughs> you expect out me to pay attention the range of dates are <laughs> the range of dates are oh. 1150 to 950 bc so so you're talking about a couple of hundred years centered around uh, a thousand BC, late Bronze Age, um, There you go. Uh, yeah. Indeed. Uh, so I, I think... yeah, that's that's <clears throat> it. Uh, unprecedented amount of bones in uh, in one mm, exposed mm. location. I think, from the researcher's point of view, it was the fact that it's uh, an unprecedented type of of site as well to have uh, a, a, a one site that's repeatedly Indeed. used over over time. Um, they tried to liken them to the Roman Ustrinum, um, which is a, a, a singular place for a funeral pyre. But usually, the remains are taken away after after the fire, uh, uh, you know, has all the burning's been mm. done. But in this case, they're staying in the same place. Uh, I suppose the other way mm. um, uh, uh, of putting it, you know, the surprise about it is, I can't think there, uh, of anything quite like it if you find cremated remains i can't think of a site where remains have been found when it hasn't been in a deliberate burial kist or barrow or what have you not just the same place burn Mm. burn burn over and over again anyway i think we've made the point (laughs) oh sorry i didn't show Mm. you any um uh, uh pictures um from the site, um, not that that's going to edify anybody yeah, much. It looks like a burnt they're place. Not, <laughs> they're not not hugely informative. Yeah. Not hugely informative. Uh, yeah, Chubby and, and, says, and what once you've seen found, uh, once you've go, seen one uh, pile of uh, <laughs> cremated remains, you've seen <laughs> bo- yeah. cremated bone. You've yeah. seen the lot. Yeah, yeah. The, those those are the uh, th- those are the photographs that were published in the in the research paper. And uh, yes, you can see there's not really. It's not really that's very informative. Um, uh, yeah, Chubby said what animals were found. Well, uh, uh, apart from uh, we know that there were deer of some description. Don't, they didn't specify other than they've talked about antlers. So that could have been, uh, you know, we're talking about uh, Italian Alps here. So any number of, uh, of wild goats uh, possibly in there. Um mm-hmm. And, now my focus uh, is gone. Um, One minute. Uh, I, I'm still. I won't go away. Just need to fix that. Well, it's all working. It's all working yeah. very well this evening. Have you tried switching uh, it off and switching it on again? Uh. <laughs> Ta-da! Oh, dear. Uh, yeah, uh, Martin's probably sitting in the green room, regretting his decision to join us already. <laughs> he's smi- I can see he's got a smile. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, lordy yeah. lord. Anyway, uh, kind of, um, moving on. Shall I move on now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. 8,200-year-old uh, burials in Russia contain pendants crafted from human bone. Well, that's it, really. I don't need to add <laughs> much, uh, much more to, to this. Um, yeah. The thing is, you know, coming on from so the examination of uh, animal bones as well, the, uh, and also that the um, uh, you know, the first item about Chinese uh, metallurgy is, and in you know the other items we've been mentioning, uh, <laughs> this again is re-examination of archaeology that was done in this case a uh, hundred years ago. Would you believe um, in in Russia, which is 
God, it could digress awfully to think that there was archaeology going on in this place 100 years ago because it's way out the back of beyond. You know, Russia's a huge, huge place, and this is on a tiny island next to a big island in a lake in um, uh, Karelia, which is, um, to all intents and purposes, looks like a very beautiful place indeed. But, you know, how they came to be digging there in the first place is a mystery and will remain a mystery for the moment. However... Uh, the uh, bones, um, let me show you, let me show you where that is on the map, up there, yes, way, 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 um, but here is, um, oh, it, one of those wonderful images by Tom uh, Bjorklund, um, I don't know, many of you may <clears throat> uh, be familiar with uh, other images that uh, he's uh, created, you know, recreating instances from uh, from prehistory, and uh, uh, at the risk of that terrible pun, putting flesh on the bones of our ancestors through um, very human and direct uh, depictions of uh, uh, events in in prehistory that we know from uh, archaeology. So that's his uh, representation of this particular uh, burial. And of course, you'll notice the number of um, bones, uh, trinkets made from bone that adorn um, the, you know, and the abundance of ochre. I'm presuming that's what it is, <laughs> sort of uh, an excess of ochre involved in this uh, burial as well. But the number of um, bones. Now, without any expectation... Um, um, a, a group uh, led by Christina Manama, uh, who's an archaeologist at the University of Helsinki in Finland, um, were examining um, the uh, animal bones associated with this burial, just really to find out you know, what was going on, what, what their relationship to the animals and uh, how they were using them, what the balances were. <clears throat> Um, sent a couple of pendants away for uh, examination, and uh, lo and behold, um, yeah, uh, they found that a number of the pendants were made from uh, human bone. When we got the results, I was first thinking there must be some mistake here, said Christina Malamar, an archaeologist, blah, 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 as I said um, before. So what we're talking about is um, this kind of thing. So the point is, and I'm going, uh, forgive me, I'm going to read here because um, she thought there was a mistake, but of course there was no mistake. Uh, mixed in with the ornament, ornaments made of bear, elk and beaver teeth were grooved fragments of human bone, including at least two pendants made from the same human femur, uh, or thigh bone. Uh, these bits of bone were found at the site. Uh, a cemetery with 177 burials from around 6,200 BC uh, in the Karelia region of uh, Russia. They were hunter-fisher gatherers, and their diet was centered around fish. Uh, while some were buried unadorned, others were found with many tooth and bone ornaments, some of which seemed to have been sewed into the hems of long decayed cloaks or coats and used as noisemakers or rattles. So uh, the bones don't seem to have been treated differently um, than other materials by the people who turned them into decorations. Um, they were carved rather quickly, uh, simple grooves uh, notched into their ends where cord could be wrapped. Uh, they were also similar in size and shape to the animal teeth that were found nearby, perhaps indicating that they were used as a replacement for animal teeth that had been lost from the hem of a garment. Uh, anyway, the apparent interchangeability of the bones doesn't mean that people perhaps viewed human bone as meaningless. Um, and that's a quote from Amy Gray Jones, who's a senior lecturer in archaeology at the University of Chester. Um, but then, you know, we're starting to get into all sorts of speculation. And we just thought it was a, um, a nice thing to report upon. Oh, sorry, you got bored with that image of the, um, um, of the bone while I was wittering away. Sorry about that. Uh, was there anything else you could add in there, uh, Rupert? I mean, apart from the fact it's uh, uh, what quests, as um, is so many, it's, so often it, not, the case. Not really. It, it's, on, it's only conjecture, isn't it, really, that um, mm. 
you know, we have uh, we, we have cultural views to <laughs> uh, the deceased now that are so profoundly different because so many people don't experience death uh, in the way that, you know, in the past, death was just so much part of life, whether it was, uh, uh, you know, losing children, losing parents early, losing, mm -hmm. you know, so many people now only experience, other than in times of war, only experience loss when maybe their grandparents die. You know, some people that their grandparents are, you know, it's the first funeral they ever go to. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I think that it's quite possible that if you were living in a society where uh, you were seeing death on a, a just a regular basis, it was normal, that you might even have a situation where, you know, if, if, this person loved to dance, then mm. it makes sense to, well, all right, let's keep him dancing. Make yeah. his bones into a necklace and he can keep dancing. Make his bones uh, rattle. You know, it's. It, it, keep oh, him alive. Exactly. Yeah. It's. Uh, it's yeah, uh, yeah I, I don't think it's uh, a macabre thing at all. No. But, uh, no. but there you are, it's unknowable. So. Uh, and uh, like I say, mm. as uh, more often than not, uh, new discoveries create more questions than answers mm. at which point i think we should move on to um uh our main talking point really the whole um raison d'etre of this uh, da, da, da. little prehistory show conflict in prehistory um so um, what was i going to say look at that <laughs> I don't know. You're the man with the buttons. <laughs> well, I know. I know. If anybody knows what the provenance of this picture is, let us know. I, I looked all over and I couldn't find the artist or what uh, what have you. Um, obviously, this is a uh, an actual picture of Rupert and I in a production discussion. Uh, production um, discussing, you know, what we're <laughs> going to talk about next. Uh, I don't know who that is on the ground. It's probably Rick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm not going there uh, <laughs> sorry internal joke anyway how did we get to this point why are we talking about uh, conflict in prehistory <coughs> well a few weeks ago we got rather um exercised when we saw this headline in the express chone stonehenge breakthrough as evidence of britain's first civil war found near site so when after we'd wiped our coffee from our keyboards <laughs> And I've frozen completely, but I'll <laughs> yeah. keep talking anyway. Um, yeah, um, uh, evidence of civil war found near Stonehenge. Dream on, actually. But they, the the article was talking about uh, Crickley Hill, uh, which uh, some of you already know, and we've already we've talked about in in the past. But it got us, you know, into the chain of thinking about uh, conflict in prehistory and uh, and what it uh, mm. means and what it can teach us, what there is in the archaeological record. Um, so we're going to talk about that, but now is the time. Uh, I'm glad to be able to report, you know, that our special guest um, uh, is a specialist in this area. Uh, our special guest is uh, none other than um, Dr. Martin Smith, who's Principal Academic in Forensic and Biological Anthropology at Bournemouth University. And uh, if I just managed to... Uh, uh, lock him in there. We'll be seeing him in a moment. I wish I had a button. Well, I do probably. Where I could do a fanfare when I introduce um, the the guests. Uh, nevertheless, uh, welcome you, to the you show, could. Martin. I'll do, I'll, I'll do this. I'll do this instead, though. Hello, Martin. <laughs> Gentlemen, evening. How are you? And everything's all gone very still. Eh? <laughs> yeah. yeah, good. I was just going to do this because look, look, look. I'm the only one of us that's got hair. Um, uh -huh. Are we really going to go there so soon? <laughs> Goodness gracious me. Yeah, it was rude not to. <laughs> <laughs> Pleasure to have you on, uh, Martin. Uh, I, it's a serendipity, actually, because uh, a few weeks ago I was uh, on a, a dig uh, in, um, in the Cotswolds uh, near Sirencester and uh, met Martin there for the first time. And uh, uh, knowing you know, uh, his uh, specialism, uh, I thought, oh, that would be great to have a good talk with Martin uh, sometime. So I did um, 
ask you if you'd be willing to come on here, and you said yes, and I uh, hope you're not regretting it now. No, <laughs> Uh, terrific, <laughs> terrific. Well, I'll just uh, kick off by say in your own words how you came to this place. You know how you got to to your in particular interest that you follow uh, in uh, in archaeology and your position at Bournemouth. Okay, well, I suppose um, uh, taking an interest in in conflict in the past really grew out of having an interest in, in injuries to the skeleton as a as a as a particular sort of um, I don't know. I suppose subspecialism within biological anthropology or osteoarchaeology, whatever we're going to call the, um, the discipline of looking at human remains from, from uh, the archaeological past. So I suppose it's a, it's a niche, a niche within a niche, really. So I'm, yeah. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm not just a nerd, I'm, I'm a nerd's nerd, I suppose. But, uh, <laughs> You're in the right place. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. And this is, this is one, of, one of my nerdy interests among, amongst others. But uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, how did I get to it? I suppose it's, it's one of these... Um, uh, one of these instances where you can only really join the dots up when you when you look backwards and um so uh once once upon a time way back in the early bronze age i i didn't work in archaeology i'm actually i'm actually a qualified nurse as well believe it or not oh right. um, yep. and uh when during my nursing career i was very interested in orthopedics so looking at fixing bones and muscles and so on very interested in surgery and the place that i worked the most and that I enjoyed the most, found the most interesting, was working in accident and emergency. So, uh, and within working in A&E departments, I saw a lot of what we call, what we call trauma. Um, so, yeah. you know, by which we, you know, not, we're not talk necessarily talking about psychological trauma, but, but um, uh, clinical trauma. So, uh, so again, in, in, injuries to the body caused by all sorts of things from very, from very minor things to, to really catastrophic things. And so, yeah. um, I already had an interest in in uh, the uh, the effects and the treatment of injuries in living people, mm. um, and then when I later went off and did my archaeology degree and then specialised in human remains because that was the thing that I uh, that grabbed me the most and that was the bit that I seemed to understand the best. Um, mm. I still don't understand pottery; it's completely confusing to me, but I'm, I'm sure it's very good. Um, but um, but I, I I prefer skeletons, but um, then, in um, as I got into osteoarchaeology, uh, my area of specialism, my PhD was looking at human remains from um, Neolithic long barrows in Britain. Yeah. Um, and initially, the initial question I had was just simply going back to these assemblages that had often been excavated a long time ago, sometimes decades ago, sometimes in the 19th century, a bit similar to the, the Russian material excavated 100 years ago that you were mentioning earlier, um, and having a fresh look at them, applying modern techniques, modern standards, and so on, to say, well, what can we actually say that we can be sure about in terms of what are these people doing with their dead? Yeah. And in doing that, um, along the way, I started to notice some odd things every so often. Uh, what you'd notice is people with um, suspicious holes in their heads um, that um, didn't really work as being interpreted as sort of post-mortem damage. Yeah. Um, a, a, a real a key point about um, the study of injuries in human remains is that um, uh, living bone uh, fractures uh, that breaks uh, injures differently from old dry archaeological bone, and that yeah. is God's. To anthropologists, basically, For because sure. um, uh, effectively, bone is uh, marvelous stuff. It's, it's this amazing composite material. It's a very complex at a microscopic level. It's got an amazing structure. Five hundred million years of evolution involved in bone. It's great stuff. Um, but bone principally has two components. It has a mineral component. Everybody thinks bones are made of calcium. Well, yeah, they are. But it has a mineral component, but it also has an organic component, a protein component, and and uh, bone is a complex structure, a complex scaffolding of sort of protein fibers with these mineral crystals held in it. Um, and the point there is that um, when we find old, dry archaeological bones, um, what's happened is the organic bit has largely gone; it's largely decomposed. So what we're finding is just the mineral part of bone, and that's why archaeological bone tends to be very light. And very crumbly and it breaks very differently from living bones uh, so what this means is 
if you have what we, what we would call a perimortem injury, um, so what, what does that mean? It means the injury occurred sometime around the person's death. If mm -hmm. it occurred significantly before death, we'll see some reaction in the bone. We'll see some healing. So we know okay. they survived. Sure. Um, if it occurred, if it's a long time after death, we'll see very crumbly, irregular fractures. And we can say, well, this is post-mortem damage. It's not an injury that occurred while the person was alive. Um, but if we see breaks that have very sharp margins, um, for example, if, if say it was an injury to the skull, what you tend to see is, is very linear fractures with sharp angulated margins. You know, living bone breaks like porcelain. Whereas old, I always say to the students, you know, living bone yeah. breaks like chocolate. If you were to hit a chocolate Easter egg with a hammer, that's how a living skull breaks. Dry archaeological bone breaks like biscuits or like like Jacob's cream crackers. Other cream crackers are available. But, um, <laughs> so, um, but the point here is going going back to initially Neolithic people, well, I started to see thing, things like uh, fractures that look like fractures in porcelain that must have happened around the time the person was alive. Mm -hmm. um, there's no signs of healing. Uh, that are the resulting from what would be a really significant impact to the head. And you look and you go, blimey, whoever did that, they really meant it. Um, yeah. Fractures that are caused by rounded shaped objects, club like objects, yeah. um, punctures that are caused by a, a sharp elliptical pointed object um, and uh, consistent with an arrowhead base, basically. Yeah. And um, so I kept seeing these things along the way. And, and uh, so after my PhD, this was something that had really grabbed me and I sort of picked it up and ran with it really. Um, but uh, what, was, what was very good to discover was that other people were finding similar things, which is nice to know. So my, mm -hmm. my good colleague, Dr. Linda Fibiger, who's now up at Edinburgh and Professor Rick Schulting, who's over at Oxford, ah. were both seeing the same things. In yeah. Neolithic remains in particular, which was which was reassuring. So I thought, I'm not I'm not going mad here. I'm not making this stuff. So the the thing is, uh, Martin, it's a it's a relatively unexamined aspect of uh, prehistoric uh, prehistoric archaeology. It's not a route that that many people have, have have gone down, and I think some of the stuff you know that we're going to talk about uh, may be quite a surprise to uh, a lot of people. But just to you know reinforce the point that um, you know using forensic techniques or whatever you, you ha anybody has available. Um, Let's do a sort of a quick catalogue, off the top of the head catalogue, of archaeological sites that we know contain the remains of people who have met sticky ends at the hands of other people. I mean, that may be sound like a too so tall an order, but there are yeah. but there are so many. But you know, if we just reel off a few, so people you know get the context for the yeah, for the yeah, conversation. Yeah, just, just say, blimey, blimey, how long have you got? I, um, well, I I know, but there are you know a few that stick out um, yeah a few, a few that stick out in particular um let's start at an early period there's the there's the off -net cave in bavaria which is where ah. you've got them. there were uh excavated in the early 20th century you had a nest of so there was also was referred to as a nest but a pit containing human skulls and okay we know prehistoric people do funny things with their dead or rather more interesting things with them yeah. very than we do so okay but these this collection of skulls it was they were from men women and children um they got bashed in heads they've been they've been injured um mm. and these are not crania so it's not just the top of the skull without the mandible mm. without the lower jaw the lower jaw is there and the bones of the neck are there so mm. these are these are not you know ancestral bones that have been held on to and venerated for a long time you know they, they've got the bones of the neck these aren't even skulls they're heads it's seven okay. heads. Okay. So this is pretty grim stuff in the Mesolithic. Um, uh, in the in the Mesolithic, Rupert, you you um, uh, um, reminded me of one from uh, from Kenya uh, early on, a ten thousand year old. It looks like oh, a, a yeah, small yeah, scale massacre. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's uh, Natarok. Yeah, it's uh, there were twenty seven people. Um, mm. the, the thing that intrigued me most about uh, about this particular example is that uh, that some of the dead had their hands tied behind their backs. Uh, most notably, uh, one of them was a pregnant woman. 
uh, that in this instance, you know, they had, uh, you know, so clearly she was a prisoner of some sort, but uh, mm. she had her hands tied behind her back before they staved her head in. Mm. Um, the, but, you know, I mean, there are, there are so many. There's, there's um, Talem and there's Xerxes. Uh, well, exactly. Right? I wanted to leap, leap to the, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, linear band ceramic uh, stuff in, in Central Europe, yeah. Martin. Um, there are four instances yeah. that we can think of. Uh, well, yeah, there's a there's a few. So there's um, well, what happened way back in way back in the mid '80s. There's a site called Talheim in yeah. uh, in uh, central Germany. They were excavated. It was a Neolithic enclosure. Started off as a very standard research excavation of such things, um, and then they found the remains of lots of dead people. I think something like thirty four people um, in the enclosure ditch, uh, all jumbled up together. All thrown in together and initially they thought like once once again as one tends to think in this period oh look neolithic people do funny things with their dead uh, but then they started to notice that these people had axe and adze shaped holes in their heads largely in the backs of their heads as if they'd been running away mm -hmm. arrowheads in their backs and various various other nasty injuries and there were men women and children there it looked like a small community had been massacred now mm -hmm. at the time we had this, uh, this is a point I'll come to shortly, but um, uh, we had a very uh, a rosy view of prehistory in general and the yep. Neolithic in particular were in fashion. So this didn't fit the, the accepted view and people kind of scratched their heads and said, well, I don't know what to make of this. So that's, that was it. It was left, you know, left, left to sit for a while. Then um, a few years later in the 90s, there's a site in uh, Austria called Aspan Schletz. Again, um, LBK enclosure excavated uh, the uh, the ditch contained the remains of at least 100 people then they think there, there have been estimates there may be as many as 200 people there all together men women and children <coughs> and again with some really terrible injuries and again it looked like a, a community had been massacred and mm -hmm. now there's about half a dozen of these that are very well documented there's one called uh, schoenig kilianstetten near, near frankfurt oh yes <laughs> uh, yeah that's um is uh, you get a lot of points for it in Scrabble, but it's it's worth it's worth a good um, especially with the umlauts. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Good points for using an umlaut. So, yeah. uh, the same thing again looked like an entire community massacred in a ditch. There's one called Halberstadt, uh, same sort of thing. So these things keep yeah. coming up. You know, once is an incidence, twice is a coincidence, three is a pattern, and now there seems to be a lot of this going on. So um, the this. A view uh, the, the 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 rosy view of prehistory has been pretty pretty much challenged, particularly in relation to 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 the Neolithic. Yeah, so was that the idea of the noble savage? Where did that uh, that come from? <laughs> well, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, debates in this in this area really um, it might seem like a sort of very modern question, but it's a, it's a it's a centuries old debate, and it goes back mm -hmm. to there's always two figures that are always always cited in relation to this. So one is uh, they, they basically they, they characterize opposing views of the prehistoric past quite nicely now. So one is yeah. um, a chap called Thomas Hobbes, who lived in the 17th century. Um, he, uh, he wrote a book called Leviathan, which was a great big book about the state when nation states were emerging as a, as a coherent thing. And the idea of the sort of the social con contract between the individual citizen and the state and what it does for you and it was the idea that uh, you know um, peace and order and the rule of law and having personal rights and property and so on and being able to sleep at night was a good thing um, and uh, Hobbes took the view that way back in whatever the prehistoric past was whatever people thought it was in in 1640 or whatever um, mm. that life must have been pretty grim and that the, the quote that's always cited about Hobbes is he said life in the past was nasty brutish and oh short. that he was responsible for that yeah 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 and um, then his view of the past is always contrasted with the view that it was associated with Jean-Jacques Rousseau who was the, the 18th century I think early 18th century uh, he was a French-speaking Swiss uh, philosopher who um, he the, the, the term that always gets associated with him, although he didn't invent it, was the noble savage. And his idea was yep. that in their natural state, human beings are pretty nice, uh, pretty nice and pretty pretty lovely and pretty gentle, peaceful creatures. And it's only in more recent times with uh, with yeah, the, yeah. the 
nation state and wealth and inequality and technology and all sorts of terrible corrupting influences that have yeah. made people nasty and bad and that's in their normal state. Being Very good. Yeah, so, very good talking point. Kevin Riley asked uh, what evidence on ancient human bones for cannibalism. And we were going to mention that before we leave the LB uh, the linear band ceramic. And that, of course, is uh, uh, we could mention the Herxheim uh, again um, um, yeah, in that Central European area. Hmm. <coughs> Well, that's a bit of a it's a bit of a can of worms, really. Can, the yeah. issue of cannabis, you could you could do a program on it, and um, you it would be a long time before you uh, said the last word, really. Yeah. Um, it's it's a difficult one. Um, cannibalism it's a, it's a, it's a subject where um, mm. I didn't really want to do a deep dive on it. I just wanted to you know register okay, with Kevin yeah. that you know that there is a site that displays. Yeah. On the one hand, we have human remains with cut marks, particularly yeah. from the Neolithic. And sometimes people get very animated. With and what? Excited. Sorry, Martin. Cut uh, marks. Cut marks uh, like flint, flint tool marks mm -hmm. on bone. And people can get yeah, very yeah, excited. Yeah, yeah no, you can really go, Ah, cannibalism. And uh, you well, you know, it might be. Or this might be relating to people's burial practices and so on. Defleshment, so yeah. Most of the time, it's defleshing, it's burial practice. Yeah. Um, there are some sites, like there is this site, Herxheim in Germany, where you've got lots of disarticulated bones with cut marks on where they had been separating the tops of the skull um, and then stacking them together. And the question is, are these skull cups? I mean, I don't know. They could be. Herxheim is a challenging site to make sense of as to what's going on. Um, yeah. it'll, it'll be debated for a while. There's probably better evidence of cannibalism in the, in the Paleolithic, actually. Mm. Um, okay okay but, yeah but, and then there's also the issue of well, what is cannibalism and there's there, there, you know is it uh, is it what you do to defeated enemies is it what people do when they're starving uh, is it uh, is it a form of burial practice to uh, to yeah. Yeah. Consume the dead, yeah. sure. as i said it's a can of worms worms before we leave the uh, lbk I think it's the springboard for, you know, half of the talking points about uh, conflict in, in the past. And that is the types of engagement that seem these uh, LBK sites seem to epitomize are those of societies under pressure. It's interesting that the dates for these kinds of sites are towards the end of... You know, we call it the LBK culture, but it was much more complicated than that. But it's towards the end that we can call that um, kind of period. And the LBK, of course, you know, the first, um, uh, some of the first farmers uh, coming over into Central Europe from Anatolia and, and, and f further east. So they'd had a long time of establishment and all these, uh, e this evidence that we have is stuffed towards the end of that period, suggesting that they were being successful, but too successful in that there were, you know, there was a pressure for territory, t pressure for uh, um, food, pressure, you know, uh, of, of simply eking out a, a living from what you've got. So it, that that is um, one side of the argument. We could say perhaps for uh, pressure or a violence of this sort being um, born out of the context of where people are and their needs for survival. And the other the other side of the argument we can get onto is when you later we've got Crickley Hill and we've got uh, Talents, of course, which are organised warfare, you know, organised uh, battles where there's been planning, you know, when, when there's a clear objective to, to what's going on that everybody's aware of. This sort of stuff seems to be out of some kind of stuff being out of kilter, some sort of um, pressure on the societies uh, that uh, were enacting them. You see what do you, do you see where I'm sort of trying oh, to yeah, tease yeah, it up? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that's a that's a really good point. Uh, I mean, something that used to be suggested was perhaps these LBK um, LBK warfare is about uh, this sort of expanding expansion of farmers coming into Europe and 
uh, meeting uh, meeting uh, hunt, hunter gatherers and foragers, and that there was a sort of wild west type frontier. But now that that, that doesn't mm. really work. But as you Can say, I just interrupt you a moment, uh, Martin? Uh, Gary R fifty five says LBK. I'm sorry, so sorry, Gary. Uh, yeah, stands for linear band ceramic, uh, German word, which refers to the type of pottery they were making. It's a sort of general. Um, uh, it, it was the design of their pottery. Do you know what? I mean, this is complete off the off off topic. Do you do you think how horrified would people in the in prehistory <laughs> be to find out that they were named for their pottery in <laughs> yeah. further down the line, rather than their axes or their swords or what have you? <laughs> anyway, uh, but that's the uh, yeah ceramics. Uh, well, uh, we, we can all say that proud members of the, the coffee mug culture <laughs> yeah. as, as we will be called in the future <laughs> you, you yeah you absolutely my point anyway um, yeah but yeah coming back to yeah where were we aha yes um <clears throat> well yeah the, the, the question of um why people are fighting what motivations there are is is sort of you know a, a couple of jumps on from initially noticing that we've got this evidence for um, human remains, which are uh, with nasty injuries, which I always call sort of nuts and bolts approach that's telling us that yeah. people are being unpleasant to each other. To, then, the, then you have the question, well, is this warfare or what is it? Um, and then <coughs> um, you, the next question you've got is, well, why are people doing this? What are their motivation? And to an extent, it depends who you ask and what their, what their background is. So um, um, evolutionary anthropologists tend to look back into our deep evolutionary past and make uh, and say that we are hardwired to do these kind of things and basically say it's just what people do. Um, cultural anthropologists tend to take the view that we're not hardwired and all of this is, is just a purely sort of a, a cult cultural and social strategy. Um, it's nothing to do with our biology. Um, if you ask an archaeologist, very often you get a very materialist explanation. So they yeah. will tell you the population has expanded and people are there's pressure on resources or they look at the they start looking at pollen diagrams and um, and uh, uh, beetles in uh, in uh, in, in the environmental archaeology and looking for some sort of environmental downturn. I always think it's, it's a kind of a joke. If, if you ask an archaeologist why there was a war, they'll say, "Oh, it's because it was raining. Uh, the, the weather was really bad." Um, but um, <laughs> okay, these things may may have may have um, a, a great deal of currency. But what I, what I think is going on in the Neolithic, in particular. Um, is uh, I think the, uh, the, uh, the 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 base of society has changed. The, the particularly the, the economic base of society has changed, and the the structure of society has changed. Um, so, um, if you are, for example, if you, if we go back to the Mesolithic again, if you're a, a, a forager, if you're a hunter, um, even if you're a really good hunter, you're not going to kill something every time you go off, um, mm. and even if you do. OK, well, you can share it with other people and that helps cement the uh, relationships and friendships, et, et cetera, alliances. But, you know, you can bring your deer back on your back that you've killed today. How many people can you share it with? Well, you might be able to share it with, you know, whatever, six, seven, eight, ten people maybe, but you're not going to share it with 40 or 50 or 100. Um, if you're a successful farmer and for a lot of the Neolithic farming initially largely is going to be herding, it's pastoralism. Yeah, they're, they're almost... They're farming rather than farmers. They're kind of gardeners, if anything. Uh, but um, if you're if you're a successful herder, over time you can build up a really big herd. And this is the point about the Neolithic: is wealth walks on four legs in the Neolithic. Yeah. And if you can build up a really big herd, you know, so that suddenly you get inequality coming in. You're getting essentially wealthy people and less wealthy yeah. people. And when we look at pastoral society, pastoralist societies in the modern world, societies based on herding, cross-culturally all over the place, they seem to end up as polygamous societies. And this is the idea that um, if wealth is being passed on through the male line, very wealthy individuals cropping up, you start to get individuals who can support more than one spouse. Yeah. And if you can support more than one spouse, if you suddenly have nearly some Neolithic men who've got three, four, five, six wives, for example, they're going to have a lot of offspring. And suddenly you're going to, and if you let a system like that run for just a couple of generations, you're going to have some very powerful patriarchs emerging who right. can command the regions of a lot of people. And at the same time, 
if you've got a society now where you've got some men marrying with multiple women, that means you're going to have some men who don't get to get married at all, who feel disenfranchised. What do they do about that? They go raiding. And that's what I think we're seeing in the in the archaeological record, particularly in the in the, in the skeletal record. Oh, um, I've wow. been making this point for, for several years and kind of um, people at conferences have kind of looked at me and smiled, smiled, smiled politely and I'm going, yes, yes, okay. And I can see they think I'm a little bit bonkers and I need to get out more. But um, recently at the, we've had the, um, the genetic study published of Hazelton North Longbarrow. And what did they find? They found <laughs> a big man individual who has had children with four different women. You've got five generations within that family and you've got this patriarchal figure at the top. So I, I, think, I think that's what we're seeing in the Neolithic. I think society suddenly has become very, very unequal and unstable. And that's why we see this eruption of, of unpleasantness in the Neolithic. Um, mm. but, but, but there you go. It's very different from the, the rosy view that people had 20 or 25 years ago that the Neolithic was a time when there was no wealth differentiation, that people came together, well, and everything was very... It's an um, interesting theory that, uh, 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 that, that there's a theory now that one of the reasons that the church created this situation where uh, you, you have, you know, that a man marries a woman and they stay together for life and they, they have children, that one of the reasons for, subconscious as it may have been, one of the reasons for creating this idealised family unit was a way of stabilising society, that, uh, that you would actually remove this built-up aggression uh, because you were spreading things out uh, more uh, more generally, and that makes a lot of sense to me. I think that's quite mm -hmm. likely. Cool. Yeah. So we, I mean, we've sp yeah. sorry, we've sp spoken a lot about you know um, um, uh, relatively well known sites, you know, the, to do with with conflict. What is the sort of general evidence? Because we talked about Hazelton North here. Um, there are but there are many burial sites, barrows in particular, and the uh, ratio of uh, skeletons with injury is 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 quite high, isn't it? Pointing um, towards, it yeah, yeah, yeah it, is, it is for the Neolithic. Um, yeah, so that that's a, a you know that's not a, a sort of evidence from a particular point where some conflict has gone on. But there's generalised uh, ratios of injury displayed in, uh, uh, you know, general burials. Uh, Wayland yeah. Smithy. Yeah, yeah, you're quite right. In uh, yeah. for for Britain, um, it's it's about uh, it's a um, it's about twelve percent of individuals that we have have got have got a weapon injury. So either a blunt injury. Or there you go. Flip me. Yeah, I think. <laughs> And, you know, 12%, that's, that's one in eight individuals. If you imagine the idea of one, one in eight individuals amongst our there friends you and go. family <clears throat> have a serious assault tomorrow, it's, it's horrific. Yeah. And, um, and the thing is, this doesn't seem to be peculiar to Britain. So going back to Linda Fibiger, Rick Schulting, Brilliant. and a whole range of international colleagues who've come together on this subject. And Brilliant. We're seeing this all across Europe. It seems to be a sort of... Uh, 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 series of events that happens during the Neolithic, when societies cross into becoming, into Neolithization. It seems to be an aspect of yeah. it. So, I mean, I, 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 think, I think people taking that on board will have a, a vision of the Neolithic and Neolithic farmers just switched around, switched on its head there. I mean, it has for me, actually. Yeah. For, <laughs> to to a large, a large I'll just mention something I spotted. And that is somebody saying about Ertzi. Dear Ertzi is so well known, a Google user. Uh, I think we assume this audience is aware of it. Well, we assume nothing, but you know, Ertzi is an individual example amongst uh, uh, quite a lot. Um, but I don't think Ertzi on his own tells us much. That's the thing, isn't it? So, that is an interesting character, though, and certainly, yeah, it's, uh, I always say this about. Uh, prehistoric projectile wounds. All the best people have got one. Okay. Kennewick <laughs> Mountain has got one. That's a, that's a story for another day. But yeah, Ertzi only, he has a blunt head injury. He has a defense wound to his hand yeah. of the kind seen in modern forensic cases when people mm -hmm. try and 
they're being attacked with a, a knife or something, they put their hands up and they get these horrible, mm. you know, terrible injuries to the to their to their, mm. um, <clears throat> to their hands. Um, but he also famously got an arrow in his back. And yeah. initially, when he was first looked at in the in the um, early nineties, they they X-rayed the body, and there were you know this was of course the the best preserved prehistoric person that had ever been found. There was you know a thousand and one questions about him. Um, mm all sorts of things to do. And at one point, somebody noticed a sort of funny, fuzzy blob on one of the x-rays and said, what's that? And somebody else said, don't know. Uh, we'll come back to that. And they came back to it something like 15 years later when the body was um, CT scanned with a, with a much better CT scanner than was available in the early 90s. And they created a, 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 a 3D version of the fuzzy blob and went, oh, blimey, it's a stone arrowhead. And he's been shot through the scapula, through the shoulder blade. So he didn't just die accidentally up in the Alps. He was, he was killed. Yeah. Blimey. So, uh, going back to the Neolithic, uh, it seems uh, cattle raiding was a thing. I, I suspect very much that it was. Cattle raiding is absolutely the thing. Um, yeah. Um, and, uh, one of our eternal bugbears is that farming is clearly such a major thing that never gets discussed. And if you are keeping herds of animals, then you're going to be protecting them from any number of people who want to take them from you. Didn't you find the other day, Mike, that there is a word in uh, f for the cattle raids of prehistory? I wouldn't dare. There is a uh, word? It, it, like, it could what, be. It, I about, uh, it, no it, but Irish but well enough. If there's a word, it, but, but if there's a word for a cattle raid, it's the, the raid, cattle raid of Cooley. It's happening a lot. If you, it's the the cattle raid of Cooley. I think in the Ulster cycle, uh, you know, the, it's there's the ten bow. Kulania, I think it is <laughs> the cattle raid. So yes. Graham's just said in the chat is, is there, the yes, cow. The white bull, exactly that. Yeah. So Tain must be cattle raid, you know. But I don't know. But it, but it's obviously a thing, and that's not the only tale of a of a cattle raid and and things in Irish mythology. So yeah, I mean the cattle raid of Cooley was uh, near just before uh, um, what about fifty. BC or something like that, as the timings can be worked out. Anyway, anyway, time moves on. Before we leave all this, <clears throat> we can't go away without mentioning uh, some more organised examples, or I should say, uh, examples of organised warfare or uh, organised raiding or battles, whatever. Uh, Crickley Hill, uh, Hamilton Hill. And Tolens, those are the things that uh, spring to mind. I'm sure there are more. Tolens you probably the, know. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> yeah uh, uh, there's also Alken Enger, which is a, a, a an Iron Age example in Germany. So, oh, right. Um, okay. Yeah. yeah so uh, we have examples that look like, you know, organized, you know, large scale organized conflict, which has to be planned in advance, has, has, to, has, has to involve a lot of people. Um, yeah. And with these. Um, as, as these uh, you know, Neolithic massacre sites keep showing up in, in Europe, people have asked before, well, is there anything like that for Britain? Well, on the one hand, there isn't. But on the mm. other hand, we do have enclosures that have clearly been attacked. So Crickley yeah. Hill in Gloucestershire is attacked by a large number of archers because there are hundreds and hundreds of arrowheads all around the, the defences yeah. of the enclosure. There's Hambledon Hill down here in Dorset, same sort of thing. The fences are burnt down. Um, there are the skeletons of two of the defenders underneath the collapsed defences, one of whom um, has got an arrow in his ribs. Oh, um, I didn't know that. So, yeah. I mean, a point, made, a, a point made by Rick Schulting about this is, OK, well, we haven't got any terrible mass graves and massacre sites in Britain, but the people who are attacking those enclosures, well, they're trying to get in there to do something, and whatever it was, it probably wasn't very nice. Um, and going back to the point about cattle raiding, I think the other thing that's probably going on in prehistory is raiding for people. Um, yeah. oh, coming back yes. to the um, coming back to some of these these um, European massacre sites that we've got, there are odd things going on with them when you start looking at the demographic makeup. So going back to Talheim earlier, um, at Talheim there are uh, adults of all ages. Um, there are um, older children, but there are there are there are no small children. It's odd. So the question is, where are the small children? Uh, they must oh. have been around. So what's happened? Either um, they're buried somewhere else or they didn't kill them, but they just were left them to fend for themselves, which effectively would kill them, or they've taken them away. 
within the attacking community has taken them away they've been subsumed within it going back to uh, Aspen Schletz the site in Austria something that was noticed there is there are adult males of all ages um, there are older adult females there are children of all ages there are no females of childbearing age in that mass wow. grave and then the thing is there are little children there so yeah. so that raises the question where where are their mothers it looks mm. like they they've been taken away so wow. you know it looks like raiding in the neolithic is about it's about raiding for people as well as mm. raiding for for stuff mm. so um, it may be you know coming back to the numbers i was citing earlier i mean it may be the case that the neolithic was the point in the human past when you were most likely to die at the hands of another human being and actually things have actually been getting better ever since so i, I will say there's there's never been a better time to be alive and uh, i mean there was a book that came out a few years ago that viewers may be familiar with was which was stephen pinker's book um oh, yeah. on uh, it was it was, uh, had an awful title it was called something it's called the better angels of our nature uh, and it was about the decline in human violence but it's a, it's a, it's very good actually it's come in for a lot of flack but Pinker has argued that um, human beings have been getting progressively less violent over over uh, recent, recent centuries and even millennia. The problem he had was he only had historical evidence to go on. And the further back he tried to go, the more fuzzy it becomes and the less he could say. <clears throat> if you look at the prehistoric <clears throat> evidence, I think Pinker was, was actually right. A, a really good question. If we can quickly answer it. From, right, and there's also the uh, f from uh, the, uh, the the simple. Fact. What? Uh, go on. Uh, some well, uh, Shay. Uh, think. Go on. Oh, uh, Shay. Shay. Uh, hi, Shay. Good to see you, mate. Um, um, asks if the twelve percent uh, is specific to a time period. Um, I won't answer that for you, but I think I know the answer. Uh, or is this recorded over thousands of years? <clears throat> uh, that's that's for all the Neolithic individuals we have. So yeah. there, there is the issue there. But having said that, most of them for Britain, for example, are clustered during the period of the Long Barrows. Yes. So we have great chunks of Neolithic when we don't have very many human remains. Yeah. Um, so and the period of the Long Barrows is is round about three thousand nine hundred to round about three thousand five hundred. You know, so it's only about it's about a sort of three hundred ish year year. Um, yeah. Yeah. For uh, sure. Period. <coughs> I have to say, before we move on, um, if anybody, have, uh, any of you have access or can get easily or are in the area of Crickley Hill uh, down in Gloucestershire, do pay a visit. It is a wonderful site to visit because the imagination uh, takes uh, flight because it's so easy to imagine what happened on that promontory because the defenders would have had uh, a cliff basically at their back. They had nowhere to go. And they had the enemy advancing on a flank of uh, barely a hundred yards across uh, towards them, uh, their defended site. So, uh, apart from being a, a multi-phase site where you've got all sorts of things going on over time, um, but the imagination can take flight as well. And the view's great. The view's lovely up there. Can't go without mentioning Talens and just saying a bit more about Talens. Um, Rupert, you, you, you. I just want to pick up on a, another point, though, because uh, we were talking across each other because we're out of sync. Uh, mm -hmm. That was about uh, Pinker's uh, research because I, I think it's a very interesting point uh, on a, a larger basis, really. That uh, you know, not just prehistorically. That that the reason we have become less violent is because our settlements and population sizes have become so vast in comparison. And so the risks that you take, uh, you know, the numbers of people that are going to be killed if you're going to set up any conflict become exponentially greater. You know, I mean, uh, you know, everybody after the First World War said never again. And, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, and here we are. And, and every time there's another conflict, it takes you into a scale that obviously you would never have had in the uh, Neolithic uh, and onwards. So we're, we might seem to be insane in, uh, in a lot of the violence that goes on globally, but we're, we're actually very cautious when it comes to the risks that we take on the numbers of expected dead. Uh, but if you go to indigenous peoples in different parts of the world, uh, particularly in some places in uh, in South America, you know, you, you see uh, that violence on an individual basis or on a uh, on a lower scale 
uh, seems to be very, very similar to the levels of violence that you had in the Neolithic. Uh, you know, small communities are just as violent uh, in their in their smaller scales. Um, but having said that, yes, tolerance. Um, I, I, for me, tolerance is one of the most evocative um, and enigmatic uh, aspects of battle in prehistory uh, that I can think of. Because here's a situation where you had, uh, you know, whoever these people were coming from the north, the people from the south came together. Uh, groups of people, different groups of people, different settlements, different tribes came together to fight a common foe. Mm. The the organization of that battle is mm. immense. How long did it take for, you know, what what were all those, and it's unknowable, what were all those things that came together to make that battle so important? I was well, joking, know, about, I mean, I was we joking, joking about, about this the um, other day. This image, uh, but in actual fact, it is meant to be a depiction. There was, there was a comment of uh, uh, of uh, the Battle of uh, Tullens. Again, I don't know what the provenance is, but uh, just thought I'd mention that in passing. Sorry, Rupert. Beg pardon. Interesting. No, that's all right. It's interesting. Mm. We, we, but we were half joking about it the other day mm -hmm. when uh, you know I, I said it, you know it's almost Lord of the Rings ish. You know that uh, you you have, you know that it's the elves and the dwarves and the hobbits and everybody's come together to to uh, to fight the dark forces. It really is like that. You know that uh, that it's so many different groups of people came together for this battle. Um, uh, and yet it's it's unknowable it's it's huge well what's your take on that martin um well just uh, similar to what you said really that you know here we have this um this site that view viewers may may be familiar with or may not where uh, effectively what we've got is a river valley and lots and lots of human remains um cropping up um in the coming up out of the riverbanks that have been transported by the, te the technical term for this is fluvial transport being transported by um uh by by the river over time it looks like what's going on is there are there are burials somewhere probably mass burials and that at somewhere up river the river is cut into them and human bones are being carried down and again lots of human remains very well preserved with some really nasty injuries with arrowheads stuck in them and and, and so on so these look these look to be the 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 uh, the dead of a battle. Um, so, uh, um, yeah, we have a we have a question um, in relation to archaeology. You know, how would how would how would we recognise warfare in the past? What does what does it look like? Um, I mean, one of the reasons why uh, it was until fairly recently thought there wasn't much uh, organised conflict going on in prehistory was because of the, the the problems of identifying the evidence. So, yeah, if we go. I'll just jump quickly. If we go back to the Iceman, well, there, there's people aren't main manufacturing any artifacts that you would describe as weapons. You know, the Iceman's axe is a woodworking tool. The Iceman's bow is a hunting tool, and and and, and so yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, so, in terms of well, what might we accept as evidence? Well, we might accept weapons. So now, the problem we've already always had with uh, the Bronze Age in particular, but also the Iron Age, is people have said, "Oh, you've got all this stuff, all these war, this." warrior gear being created all these fancy swords and um uh, bronze shields that actually are probably aren't very good but you know that's a story for another day and um, horned helmets in various you know the, the one time you do get horned helmets in the european past is in is in the european bronze age um and that and um People have said, "Yeah, well, these are just these are symbols of status they're symbols of status and power and, uh, and wealth <laughs> We keep up with the neighbours. It's how you impress people. They're making them so that they can deposit them in sacrificial spots because mostly they get they turn up in wet places. So um, you know it doesn't tell you that there's any actual fighting. There's probably not much at all. People have said, and then you can think, well, what about defences? You know, building defences. That would be the argument. If people are expending all the time and the effort to build defended sites, it must be because they're expecting to be attacked. And then the argument there has the counter argument has been. Or the, what you might call the postmodern argument is is um, ah yes, but these are these are a bit like you know a lot of sort of later medieval castles. They're they're to show off, and 
Okay, a lot of late medieval castles, though, to show off the fact that you could afford Italian stonemasons and you could get plumbers over from France and you, you've got better toilets than everybody else. And you've got, you know, these things, they've got economic centers, they're, they're uh, areas that show off people's power and status. Um, so they don't tell you how much fighting there was. And this is the, the explanation for a lot of Iron Age hill forts in particular. Like, yeah. well, they're just status. And, um, but so the one. The one bit of evidence that is very difficult for people to explain away is is the human remains. And now we're starting to see um, human remains turning up in some sites from um, various prehistoric periods uh, in in good numbers, demonstrating that, you know, this this uh, this stuff was this stuff was real. People people really were fighting each other in, in an organized manner at this time. Great to talk to you, Martin. Mm. We I can get Go we've got Google to the point user. where uh, we could go down so many different avenues, and I hope you'll come back and you know uh, we we'll go through the subject in uh, in more detail. We you know we've talked for almost an hour <laughs> inside this show already, which is uh, 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 amazing. Uh, I know. I'm just going to pick up on a comment here, though. It's yeah. uh, Google user says it's eerily similar to the defiance of Vercingetorix, oh. and uh, yeah, I just uh, have to agree with that. He's talking about Tolens. Yes. Uh, that uh, yeah, Vercingetorix, the uh, the the Gaulish king who uh, uh, who got all his. Uh, in fact, he he got all the Gauls together, didn't he, to try to fight uh, the the Romans? Failed, yeah. of course. Yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah, I have to agree with that. Yeah. So, Martin, uh, just one yes, last yeah. thing um, before. We, I mean, just just a few words. Uh, do do you think <clears throat> that we're on a fool's errand? Or is there something in prehistoric archaeology, because it's um, so in your face, you know, the evidence, it's, it's black and white, uh, especially when you're talking about the, the forensics, rather than history, where somebody gets to tell a story about what happened, the victor always tells the story, and all those kinds of things, and, and, and spin and all the rest of it. Is it a reasonable mirror to look into, to, you know, find... Um, whether or not we are intrinsically violent or or not, um, yeah, well, I, I, I I think it is. Um, mm. I, I think it's because what well, the the despite all the all the limitations and all the problems and difficulties we have in archaeology in general mm -hmm. and in osteoarchaeology in in particular, at the same time, the one great advantage we've got over, say, for example, the modern social sciences is we've got this tremendous time depth that we can yeah. look at and we can say well if we look at human beings across culturally um, and diachronically would be the fancy word that academics use you know a, across time going back into deep time we can start to say well at what point do we first see evidence for um for organized warfare and for for warfare at all and just a very quick point is um you know the, one of the one of the many challenges in this area is how do you define warfare you know there might be all sorts of forms of prehistoric violence which aren't necessarily war so some people say a oh, war is when there's uh, it, it, it's large scale there's lots of people involved well you know uh, a big a big fight in a pub for example might involve a lot of people but it's not a war they, they, it's not been planned in advance it's not organized and so on um and then if we look at a lot of war in um sort of pre-industrial societies what they actually do they it's conducted on a small scale there might be a raiding party of just say a dozen individuals and what they'll do they'll go out <laughs> kill one or two people from an opposing group and then go home and then tell stories about how brave they were. And then a few months yes. later, the raiding party will come from the other group and do the same thing. And that's, but in these people's head minds, they are at war. And yeah. there's a chap called Raymond Kelly, who is a social anthropologist. And he suggested that um, it's, uh, it doesn't trip off the tongue. His, it's his theory of social substitutability. And he says, this is what defines war. And the idea is there's a funny kind of logic in warfare when you know, it's a funny thing that human beings do sometimes where they take the view that any member of the opposing group is liable for revenge retaliation whatever rather than so you could have those 12 people in the raiding party going after an individual because they are a murderer or mm. a witch or whatever they're going after that one person whereas in Warfare in social substitution, it can be any member, whether they're a child, whoever they are, of that mm. opposing group is liable. Um, yeah. So, and then there's the question, well, when did people first become capable of thinking like that? And I think it's probably 
the upper paleolithic because there's a rewiring of people's brains at that time and people get good at all kinds of lateral thinking at that time so it may be the case that anatomically modern people like ourselves had war in the, under that definition whereas earlier versions of human beings and earlier cousins of our own species certainly behaved violently towards each other but it wasn't war in that sense but that's fascinating that's, that's my gut feeling but uh, there you go yeah fascinating fascinating that's what wonderful talking to you and folk i hope you've uh, enjoyed that it's a tremendous gallop across the surface of this enormous uh, uh subject and i hope it's one that we can uh, revisit if uh, if um you know people would uh, would like that however i think uh, with great thanks it's it's time for us to move on and uh, sort of wind down the evening. Martin, you're welcome to uh, stick around. We won't be broadcasting for very much longer, uh, but there's a little yeah, um, um, topic. I mean, we usually call the end piece of our, um, uh, whatever, our thing uh, a bit of whimsy. Um, is this whimsical, this... Um, uh, what would what we're gonna? Uh, 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 well, I think it's whimsical. Um, I think it's extremely whimsical, whilst being irritating in the first instance. Uh, what happened here? What what are you putting up? Oh, what was whimsy! That That's all. Up? What a surprise! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, carry um, on. Uh, yes, you you know, uh, uh, Michael and I have a, a reputation that we're very proud of. Uh, that uh, we do keep things real. And uh, if we don't know, we say we don't know. Well, <laughs> and if we <laughs> and if we uh, if we see shoddy journalism or shoddy reporting or anything else, we call it out. And every now and again, you see something that's just patently ridiculous. And uh, one of the things that uh, winds us up um, a little bit is when you get stuff saying that. Uh, you know, people couldn't move megaliths that big. It must have been aliens or, you know, anything like that. And one of the things that cropped up fairly recently in a Facebook group that I won't name, uh, but uh, somebody had posted a photograph. Do you want me to show the photograph in question? Evidence. Yes, go on, put the photograph up. Go on. Um, there you go. And this was posted as evidence that our prehistoric ancestors had the ability to melt stone. And, uh, uh, you know, a lot of you will probably have seen that this is a subject that crops up all the time, you know, that uh, our ancestors had these technologies that we don't know anything about. How did they do this? And this really annoyed me because I know about that, uh, that piece of art. Um, uh, it is actually by a Spanish sculptor called uh, Jose Manuel Castro Lopez, whose work is utterly astonishing, really. He does all these things that it looks like melted stone anyway, but he makes these things. Some of them are ridiculously big, um, uh, but I... will show some uh, more when you've gone through your story, Rupert. <laughs> Okay, well, it's the, the the reason that we're sticking it in here as whimsy is because uh, just because, you know, our, our whole thing is, well, let's, you know, make sure that you're giving people the truth as much as you possibly can. So I put a comment on this post saying, uh, no, that's not prehistoric. That's actually a piece of art by Jose Manuel Castro Lopez, uh, who does wonderful stuff. And the admins of that page would not publish my comment <laughs> which which means yeah. you know you just have to be very cautious out there that there are some people who are really not interested in the truth in any way shape or form they just want to keep it all magical and mysterious and uh, and to hell with reality so yeah. that's why i wanted to stick it in here yeah go on uh, uh, bring However, up some in, of his other in reality, glorious pieces <laughs> That's right. Uh, th this is what this uh, guy is up to. His name uh, seems to um, roll off your tongue very easily, uh, Rupert, better than than mine. Well, but uh, uh, Jose Manuel Castro Lopez. That's yes. the one. Yes. Um, <clears throat> just extraordinary things. In, uh, that just blows my mind. I love that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, and. 
although he says, you know, his, his technique is, is not that astounding, um, it's very difficult to work out exactly how he's managing to uh, <laughs> just it's, do this stuff in stone. It's, it, it's uh, astonishing. Brilliant vision in the first place. Uh, yeah. uh, yes, yes. He just, uh, he just. It, it's a bit like you know that there's that, that wonderful story about Michelangelo uh, when uh, when he was looking at a block of marble for mm. uh, about ten months. He just stood yes. in his uh, in his yeah. uh, workshop ten months. He was just looking at it, and uh, and people were asking him what he was doing. He said, "I'm working," mm. um, and it was. 10 months before he then started carving and it was david that came out of uh, of that yeah. lump of marble but he he's he just looked at that piece of stone for 10 months seeing what was in it or what he could extract from it uh, yeah. and I, I think that that <clears throat> jose uh, because you know the, these are the, these are carved in stone he clearly yeah. sees what he can do with a piece of stone i think, I think it's there's just a, fantastic. There's a, from what i understand there's a similar kind of process going on you know a lot of sp time is spent in uh, uh, yeah. what can i do with this particular yeah. piece of, of stone and uh, it being yeah. very instinctual so strangely enough and not so much uh, of the plan all i can glean is <laughs> that he does use mechanized uh, implements but the trick is in 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 the yeah. finish actually is in finishing off and, and taking away the obvious uh, um, mm -hmm. mark of uh, the implements that that he uses anyway and very uh, clever staining as well it's uh, it's all that clever. that as well yeah um there is a uh, I, I haven't mm. I haven't um, done the clever thing and um, put his website up or his Facebook the the the, the place to see all his work is actually on a Facebook page, isn't it, uh, Rupert? Yeah, he does have a Facebook page, actually. Yes. Yeah. Jose Manuel Castro Lopez. Brilliant. Uh, okay. Yeah, there you go. Clever guy. Not prehistoric men melting stones. <laughs> <laughs> all right. That is it, folks. Uh, thank you so much for um, well for your input, being jolly in the chat and uh, and your questions. Sorry, we couldn't uh, notice or uh, ask uh, answer them uh, all, but it's been a very jolly evening, and um, uh, we've a oh, large thanks to Martin for a large of that. I I get from the chat that a lot of people enjoyed that conversation very much. Indeed. Yeah, very much. Yes, thank you, Martin. So, uh, mm -hmm. Terrific. Just one last thing to say. Uh, if you're not already subscribed to the channel, do please hit the subscribe button or the like channel. Uh, and we love to respond to questions and things like that. And of course, not forgetting uh, our uh, Patreon page if you like to get on board and uh, support us as we do this thing and other things and make uh, films too. It'll be a bit of a hiatus until the next mm -hmm. Um, prehistory show because as we said at the top of the show Rupert and I uh, are going to Ireland for two weeks uh, s soon um, we'll Next be reporting back from there prehistory show Very is good. on the 13th of October 13th of October and Kev asks a good question. I haven't put it up uh, on the Patreon site yet but when is the next Patreon Zoom chat? The next Patreon Zoom chap is on the chap chat is on the eleventh of yeah. October. You see, aside from all that uh, extra content that I managed, uh, I mentioned at the top of the show, our Patreon folk get their own special uh, uh, Zoom chat uh, every uh, month as as well. Wow. Okay. Uh, what's the date of that? Uh, did you say that, Rupert? Sorry, I wasn't paying attention. Uh, I, I did. Would you like me to say it again? No, the, sorry, uh, sorry, sorry. No, it's just cloth ears. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's All the right. 11th. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, I think you and I should say hello to Rosie, Michael. Oh, hello, Rosie. Hello, Rosie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's oh. all good. All right. Um, um, yeah. Thank you, folks. Till the next time. Thank you, Martin. Bye bye from me. Bye bye from me. Bye bye from. <laughs> <laughs> Cheerio, folks. Mm -hmm.